morning, good uh, afternoon, and good uh, evening, everyone. Welcome to this uh, webinar to all uh, participants and uh, attendees. My name is uh, Dr. Maria uh, Carrera, and uh, I am a research associate at the World Maritime uh, University. I will be moderating this uh, session today together with uh, Professor uh, Rafael uh, Boller, who is the head of uh, Maritime Safety and Environmental Administration at uh, WMU. At the webinar, we will uh, introduce and uh, present to the maritime community and to the general uh, public uh, the work we have uh, conducted on safety learning uh, culture for shipping as a uh, part um, of the uh, EU-funded uh, project uh, Safe Mode. That is, uh, that is uh, pretty much about um, learning, maritime and aviation learning uh, from each uh, other. And um, now I'm going to um, introduce um, Professor Jens Uwe Schorent Hinrich, the Vice President of uh, Academic uh, Affairs um, at uh, WMU who will welcome um, to you all. Next, Captain uh, Kunal Nakra, Deputy Director of the Transport Safety Investigation Bureau uh, from Singapore, will do, do the honors and um, uh, will um, deliver the keynote speech. And uh, next, Captain Jorgen uh, Sachau, Senior Maritime Safety Investigator from the Swedish Accident Investigation uh, Authority, uh, from Sweden, uh, will take the floor and will uh, provide uh, his speech as a guest speaker uh, today. So please, uh, Professor Jens uh, Uwe, please, um, the floor is yours. Thank you, Maria. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. On behalf of the management of World Maritime University, I would like to welcome you all to this webinar. It's a special privilege for me to speak at this event with such a lineup of high caliber speakers who I'm sure will share interesting thoughts and ideas with us and may provoke stimulating discussions. I wanted to thank especially my colleagues, Professor Raphael Baumler, Dr. Maria Carrera, as well as the entire Safe Mode project team for all their efforts in organizing such an excellent event and for having chosen the World Maritime University as the venue for this webinar. WMU was established by the International Maritime Organization almost 40 years ago as its center of excellence in maritime and ocean education and research in furtherance of the objectives of the organization. As part of our capacity building mission, we have educated nearly 6,000 maritime and ocean leaders who today work in almost every IMO member state to ensure that shipping is conducted in a safe, secure, and effective manner with minimal impact on the marine environment. Sustainable shipping in harmony with the oceans is the paradigm out of which all our academic programs emerge. To understand risks of shipping operations, to increase safety levels, and to avoid accidents is an essential topic and a major priority for what we try to stimulate through our educational offerings and research projects. The work of our parent organization, the IMO, has been influenced by major accidents over many years of its existence and resulted in the essential legal instruments that govern the safety of ships and their crews and protect the marine environment. The safety record of shipping today is impressive and accident numbers have been continuously reduced and are currently at an incident rate of below 2%. However, Incidents like the ever given grounding in the Suez Canal can create a major impact for the global economy. Therefore, accident investigations and learning from accidents to improve the system performance and system reliability is still a key task in maritime safety related efforts by maritime administrations and the maritime industry. It is in this context that we need to look at IMO's casualty investigation code that underlines the importance of safety investigations that do not apportion blame or establish liability, rather than try to create an environment in which all stakeholders can freely discuss what causes accidents and how can further safety improvements be best achieved. Safety investigations stimulate learning and system improvement. 
However, how can we learn from accidents? This very much depends which priority is assigned to safety and accident investigations. It also depends if safety is seen as an asset that creates the basis of successful shipping operations or not. I still remember one of the first articles I read about safety culture and shipping 30 years ago in the 1994 edition of BIMCO Review. The head of DNV at the time promoted the value of a safety culture in shipping. He encouraged ship owners to review their perspectives of safety and change from a compliance culture to a proactive safety culture in shipping companies, a culture that encourages safety improvements and uh, supports learning on all aspects of shipping operations. How much have we succeeded in this respect over the last 30 years? An important basis for any serious learning efforts from accidents is created by data. What information do we have about accidents and how accessible are these data? I'm sure that many of us here in this webinar know that the data situation can be improved. Many valuable insights are hidden in separate silos of a fragmented maritime sector in this regard. Another question mark relates to education and training of investigators and analysts in maritime administrations and the industry. Let us remind about the fact that the III code of the IMO stimulates the culture of performance review and systematic improvements in the maritime sector. However, qualification requirements vary greatly between member states of the IMO, and there are also no industry standards in relation to essential qualifications of staff members involved in accident investigations. This is why we at WMU are participating in this project with great interest in order to see how further lessons learned in other industry sectors can be adjusted to the maritime sector to create a basis for a reporting culture where individual seafarers are not afraid of sharing information about near misses, incidents, and accidents in order to enable further system improvements. Such insights are an essential ingredient for our academic programs. As indicated earlier, we've come a long way in improving maritime safety and a lot has already been achieved. However, there are still opportunities to improve, and this is why webinars as this one are so important from my point of view, and I look forward to the discussions in this forum. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Jens. Now I would like to um, invite Captain uh, Kunal uh, Nagra uh, to take the floor and uh, please uh, deliver his um, keynote uh, speech. Thank you. A very good day to all of you. A big thank you to the World Maritime University, in particular, Dr. Maria Carrera and Professor Rafael Baumler, for inviting me to deliver the keynote address at the launch of an exciting journey. For those of you who are not aware, the TSIV was formed six years ago after injecting the maritime domain into the aviation side of the house. I invite you to take a moment to process this information, which may be useful. Our audience today will certainly understand that the shipping industry is a very complex one. It is multi-layered and multifaceted. Shipping may be perceived as being the poorer cousin of aviation despite inventing the knots. We must not forget that we have always looked forward, enacted new regulations to make ships safer and people better equipped to manage them safely. In this industry, safe environments are created. They don't just exist by chance. However, there has been a tendency of the larger public to be oblivious to what happens out at sea. Out of sight, out of mind, if you may. Lately, that attention has shifted in view of the high profile incidents, if it affects them in the case, mostly directly. For example, the fear of goods not arriving on time because a ship is stuck in a prominent waterway, or expensive cars carried on a ship being gutted in the Atlantic. <laughs> that said, <clears throat> shipping is not unsafe. Ships are not designed to fail. People are not trained to cause accidents. The industry, like any other, works like a well-oiled machine. But there are so many nuts and bolts and nuanced lubrication that affect it on a day-to-day -day basis. And such events happen. We as an industry are not immune. While the focus of decarbonization in shipping has gained traction in the last decade, and we are actively working towards emissions control, the baseline of ensuring safe shipping has shaped 
how the industry has evolved. To do so, we try and understand how an event can be prevented. Many times that is the direct or sometimes indirect result of investigations, which makes attempt to piece the puzzle. We've built an ecosystem that allows the various stakeholders to contribute and learn. Learning is intrinsic. It is what makes us thrive in this world. We cease to learn and we can be certain we will cease to exist. That brings me to a word that I fondly use during some of my engagement at international forums. And that word is on the screen right now, creative. What comes to your mind is probably an artist, someone who paints or a designer. I hold the view that even seafarers are creative. They make things work by coming up with creative ways to solve problems without external intervention most of the time. These ways are ever-changing and rarely consistent. Many times we don't hear the successes which was a result of such a creativity. That's because we are focused on the process, the flowchart of doing things. If nothing goes wrong, rarely is the process reviewed to see how we can improve the learning. But we should wonder, was there an element of learning in that success? Safety learning should be an innate process within us. As humans, when we say things, do things, process them, this, when translated, as it permeates within an organization, would then enable the culture of an organization to centralize learning, empower people, and weave it back as a feedback and distribution channel. While a learning culture is a natural consequence of a reporting culture, which has a linkage to just culture, I recall a quote from Natarios Karnikas during a podcast by Dr. Nipanan recently that said, there is no research connecting just culture and learning. Just culture and reporting exist. And thus, there is an implied learning. Even if you encourage people to open up, they may not be learning. We should thus recognize the relevance of moving from a safety culture to a safety learning culture. Learning does not need to be only from negative events. Irrespective, we can and we do learn. Learning organizations learn from routine. Management learns every day, reflecting on the practices, regardless of the outcome, being a negative or a positive one. And that is where the taxonomies in the SafePort project would become even more critical. In my role as the chair of the Casualty Analysis Working Group at the IMO, we see a concerted effort to draw trends on certain types of casualties, uh, whether they're recurring despite the presence of regulations, recommendations, guidance, which are intended to prevent them in the first place and surface them to the subcommittees and committees. Having discussions at splinter groups enables us to learn from sporadic events. My dear friend, Captain Bjorn Zakao may touch on this in the next segment. And looking at the famously and widely adopted Heinrich trial, which may be deemed nowadays as having limitations when being adopted practically, imagine if the industry were to benefit from a multi-layered learning, which spans across vertically as well as horizontally. Imagine if at the base, instead of thousands of near misses, you have an equivalent successes. In conclusion, we have to recognize that in order for a safety learning culture to thrive, the disconnect between perceived and actual, between the management and the front end is addressed. I'm extremely pleased by the work done under the Safe Mode project and would like to applaud all those involved in driving this change. With that, I would like to leave the audience with some thoughts as you listen to an esteemed lineup of speakers. I wish you all a fruitful learning session. And I'm confident that the tenacity of our industry, which has seen a lot over the decades, we will embrace the change for the better. Thank you. Okay. Cool. I'm saying that thank you very much, uh, Captain uh, Kunal. Uh, Nakara for your enlightening um, keynote speech. Now I would like to ask uh, Captain uh, Gorgen uh, Sachau uh, to uh, take the floor and uh, provide uh, uh, his words. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, dear all, I must also thank you for the opportunity to take part in this event today and talk about such an interesting subject that safety culture is representing. After quite some time in the shipping industry, I have been able to observe a development of safety culture, which for sure is to the better. Better safety equipment is available, training has been introduced extensively, and organizational factors 
such as safety management systems, has become part of daily life. The result is also to be noted in fewer accidents in the long-term perspective. And still, we are not happy. And we should not be. As long as there are accidents occurring, we should keep on struggling. We still see accidents happen that should not. We know the circumstances. We have introduced learning and knowledge about those circumstances. People on board has taken part of this knowledge. And still, the very same individual, even physically signing a paper for understanding the risk identified, expose him or herself to the danger and get killed. Entering enclosed spaces is a very good example of such accidents. But how can this be? As many things in life, accident investigation development may be described as climbing the ladder. If years ago accidents were explained by technical failure, followed by causes to accidents described as operational mistakes, then later followed by organizational factors, this could represent climbing a couple of steps on the ladder. The same goes for development of safety culture. It is, at least in some aspects, like climbing a ladder. And the steps to climb, as well as the steps to take, are well known. It may not be easy at all times, but it is not rocket science. And to be frank, some steps are rather easy to take. And still we can see how organizations fail in developing, still staying at the same level or even in some cases degrade. Now, how can this happen since there is a safety management system within the shipping industry? Should not this SMS take care of these things? I have in many years taken part of the casualty analysis working and the casualty analysis correspondence group within the subcommittee of implementation of international instruments triple i in imo since a few years i have been acting as a coordinator for the correspondence group the group has recently noted that some accidents occur due to what is understood as lack of implementation of the sms a work is at this moment ongoing to try to understand why, what may be done to increase the level of SMS implementation and thus reduce risk of accidents to occur. The work is extensive and may not at all be successful, but it gives a good opportunity to actually use experience from accidents and the efforts spent in accident investigation to achieve something better. The approach of this may be from two fronts. One is addressing the sharp end, which may be represented by the single individual, such as a navigational or engineering personnel, officers or ratings. Now, what was the cause of their failure to succeed in their operation? Could it be lack of training, not using appropriate equipment? or missing supervision. The other front may be the blunt end, that is senior management, surveying organization, or even regulator level. Is the requirement of SMS what is needed? Are the minimum standards of SMS enough? Is the procedure to approve an SMS relevant? I hope very much that the result of these efforts in the working and correspondence group is trying to produce, will end up with a better safety culture and also be another means of reducing risks, hence also reducing accidents and thereby letting seafarers be able to return safe to home. I am very happy to take part in this uh, webinar and uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Capitan Gorgian and Sanchao, for your thoughtful uh, words. Now, I would like um, to move on and uh, in 
introduce um, um, Dr. Barry uh, Kirwan uh, to you, um, who is a uh, uh, European Safety Culture Program uh, Manager from Eurocontrol, um, which is the European Organization for the Safety of uh, Air Navigation. Dr. Barry uh, Kirwan has uh, led this um, maritime navigation partnership on the safety learning uh, culture, and he's going to present to us the core aspects of the uh, work uh, conducted uh, on this. Uh, for the audience, um, um, you would like to, to know that the um, PDF version of the white paper will be made available uh, to everybody uh, from the uh, Safe Mode uh, Project uh, website. So uh, please, Dr. Barakilva, <coughs> uh, the uh, floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Um, yeah, thanks very much. Um, so my name is Barry Cohen. I uh, work for your control. And uh, I'm going to talk about the white paper, which um, there's a very nice uh, printed copy available, um, which uh, Maria can send you if you, if you want copies. Um, I'd just like to mention the, the other crew, uh, if you like, have been on this 18 month journey with us. Um, Beatrice Bettini Thibault from Euro Control, um, Maria and Raphael, who are here with us today, and uh, Matteo Caccioni uh, from Deep Blue. Um, so. Yeah. Um, so I'm <laughs> sorry. Maybe I get you. To, okay. uh, I'm going to talk briefly, just one slide about safe mode because they paid for the voyage. If you like, then I'll talk about the study aim, what we were trying to do, and the approach, and then move on to the what we think is the next destination for um, for shipping potentially, which is safety learning. Um, safety learning culture. And thanks for the two previous um, speakers for really, well, three, three previous speakers for highlighting that. And, oops, moving fast. Um, then I'll talk about safety learning projects because um, safety learning culture is not just a brand. You, you need to do certain things to get there. So I'm gonna try and highlight some of the waypoints um, to reach um, safety culture. So Safe Mode is a three-year project. Um, it's funded by the European Commission, and it was specifically set up to, to enable maritime and aviation to learn from each other. And th this is really a two-way street. We are, we are learning from maritime, and uh, aviation is um, also helping maritime in some areas. Um, it's, it finishes this year, and so we're, we're in a sort of closing uh, six months of the project. And it has a focus on the human factors and design and learning lessons from safety related events, um, which is seen as good safety culture. Um, so this study aim uh, was to really look at the current status of safety culture in the shipping industry and to, to see the best way forward. And this was um, partly because aviation has been really doing a lot of work in this area. I've been involved in safety culture for 20 years in aviation. Um, so we wanted to see what can uh, really help maritime, but they, they are different domains and there are differences. So it, it's not just simply a matter of uh, handing something over to, to maritime. Now, because the three of us doing the, the interviews, um, we're not from maritime. So we wanted to really speak to people, um, the seafarers and the investigators and WMU was, was really very helpful in, in organizing those, um, those interviews. They were all done during uh, COVID, <clears throat> so they were um, online, they were confidential. They typically lasted actually 90 minutes, one of them went to two hours, um, the, the, the shortest one was about 65 minutes. We had the same structured question format, and there were two or three of us doing the interviewing, and we, we specifically didn't record the interview because we wanted people to speak openly, so we, we took written notes, and then we sent a transcript back to the people. Um, <clears throat> now, they, they had the opportunity to change something, um, nobody, none of the interviewees changed anything, which is a good sign that they, they were quite happy with, uh, with the process. Um, some of them did add more information. We then did a content analysis and looked for quotes and themes. And there's about 10 pages in, in the document, which goes through exactly what they said. Um, so you, you hear it in their own words. Um, there's too many quotes. There were hundreds of them for, for me to go through in this presentation, but in the report, there's a lot of information there. There was very high agreement, actually, it says generally high agreement, um, usually 90% of the time they were agreeing with each other, saying the same thing in slightly different ways. And this just gives you an idea of the um, segmentation of the, the interviews. We had seafarers, we had investigators, um, a range of seafarer roles, main, mainly in the main uh, captains, 
and with some chief officers, chief engineers, ratings. And there you see cargo, chemical tankers, containers, passenger ships, cruise ships, and geographically um, around the world um, uh, for, for both seafarers and investigators. So the interview process took around four months and we then presented to um, a number of uh, key organizations, EMSA, IMO, um, unions and, and a training organization. We, we presented it to them just to get their feedback and to help us understand mm -hmm. the context. That was very useful. Um, then we presented the, we started presenting res the results about a year ago. I think the first time was at the Maritime Coast Guard um, Agency, their human element uh, advisory group where we presented the results and got feedback. And this again, helped us understand the context and the best way forward. We also then presented at IMRS on um, the Stability and Safety Conference in Scotland last year, and most recently earlier this year with OCIMF. So we talk about safety culture, and safety culture is quite a big concept. Um, it's like saying engineering, it, it covers a lot of things. And so we, we broke it down into different components. And uh, one of the former speakers mentioned you can have reporting culture and uh, learning culture, just culture, et cetera. So we broke it down into these elements. Um, investigation, reporting, near miss reporting, um, safety management system, just culture and safety learning. And we, we added two in there. One, of, one was understanding the human element because this is really key. And the other one is what keeps ships safe. Um, so we actually asked seafarers um, what were the, and, and investigators, what are their top three human elements they're concerned about? And what are their top three things they believe that keeps ships safe? But all these things um, fit together under safety culture. So what I'm going to do is just give you some, some highlights um, of what was said, um, and then you can read the full detail in the, in the report, whether it's the web-based version or the, um, uh, the, the actual hard copy. So in, in investigation, a number of times we had the same, same comments. So there were conflicting objectives. So investigators are there to discern the facts what happened and the factors that led to it. Um, but they sometimes kind of come into conflict with um, judiciaries who are there to serve justice. Um, this is something we are well aware of in, in aviation. We, we have the same problem. I think it's a, it's, it's a natural problem in all transport domains. Um, but, but it seemed uh, fairly acute uh, from the investigator's point of view. Um, they felt there was sometimes a lack of trustful relationship between investigators and seafarers because seafarers feared being blamed, which could have consequences for, for them, personal consequences. And a comment there, which I'll come back to later, that the investigations rarely dig down into what we call organizational factors. Um, these, are, these are rarely reported or, or investigated. Understanding the human element, I have a more detailed slide on this later. Um, investigators said that they would like more, uh, more training on human factors. Somebody commented in, in two or three years of training they get four or five days on the human element. And yet, once they start investigating, the human element is really key. So they, they feel the balance isn't right. It also tends to be a focus on, on the individual involved rather than the system. And we've, we've already heard from a couple of speakers about that. And too much focus on procedural <coughs> compliance. In terms of reporting, um, some, some people, the seafarers said it was difficult uh, to make reports. Um, a comment we had was that seafarers avoid reporting at all costs. Um, so there, there was this un general unfavorable mindset, unfavorable mindset about reporting. It wasn't wholesale. In some cases, reporting was good, but there was a general flavor that uh, people didn't want to report unless they had to. And uh, we recognize this in aviation. We had to overcome this hurdle um, quite some years ago. And that's because they're, they're not sure about the reporting purpose. Is it really learning or is it just to blame people? And there was some mistrust between, between shore and ship, as mentioned. Near misreporting, um, surprisingly for us, got, got a lot of negative feedback on this, um, but basically it isn't working um, in most cases. Uh, not all cases, there were one or two cases it was working, but generally the feeling was near misreporting isn't working. Um, sometimes uh, ships are pushed to, to, to have a quota of near misreports, so the quality of reporting isn't good. Um, reporting systems themselves are not always easy to use. And the investigators said they, they, all their resources go on incidents and accidents. They don't have time or the tools to look at the, the near miss reports, reports, which can be um, quite extensive. 
What keeps ships safe? Uh, this, is, this is very much more positive. Um, the investigators were very positive about, about crew, basically crew and, and the captains, et cetera, saying, you know, the professionalism of the crew, the training, the resilience and flexibility was really what keeps, keeps uh, ships safe. And the last point there, procedures don't always take into account the realities of the operational context. And this is understandable to us because you, you cannot proceduralize everything. You cannot have uh, a procedure for every eventuality that can occur. So that is where you must rely on the humans who are adaptable and flexible to fill in the gaps between the procedures. Safety management system, this, this has been mentioned. Now, there were some cases where there, there were good SMS, but generally um, the feedback we got was, was not positive. Um, they were seen as burdens, burdensome and often they were generic. So there might be a, one SMS for, for a fleet of ships or a group of ships, um, and they didn't quite fit the individual ships and their needs. So they were too generic. And again, it was raised that there could be this gap in understanding between onshore departments and, and what really happens on a ship. And somebody commented that learning processes, just because, because you have learning process does not mean you have a learning culture. And this is something, again, we certainly recognize in aviation. Initially, we were very process heavy, but we weren't getting the, the output we needed. So yeah, we understand that, uh, that comment. Um, just culture, we, we had a lot of um, discussion on that. Interestingly, 50% of the participants had never heard the term just culture. Um, which was interesting to us, and so we had to explain to them. But once we explained, they, they got it very quickly. Um, of course, blame and punishment hinders learning. In aviation, we say you can either blame or learn. That's your choice, and it's actually a binary choice. And it was nice to see the presentation earlier leaning the same way. Um, it's also the needs for a systems perspective, um, which is really where just culture fits in, because it's not one person. It's the environment around them and everything uh, that's, that's supporting them or not. And safety learning, this was the, the last area we we're looking at. And this is where we got a lot of traction with people. Um, they were all very interested in safety learning, saying this is the way to go. Um, and there, there were some positive things. We, we found actually some, some companies uh, were actually, I would say, slightly ahead of aviation. Um, they're very fast um, in, in getting lessons learned to, um, to their, the ships, to the captains, to the, to the crews. But we did hear that um, often recommendations are not sufficiently applied or it can take years for, for change to happen. And again, it's reluctance to consider organisational factors. So I just want to show a couple of slides. These are from, uh, from the white paper itself. This is a, really a summary of the, the factors when we ask them for their top human element contributors. And you see the, the ones where people agreed, um, both investigators and seafarers, um, some of the usual suspects, if you like, fatigue, um, communication, complacency, et cetera. What was interesting to us on the left-hand side, the blue is from seafarers on the right-hand side, that is from um, investigators. And the, the terms don't quite line up. It's as if there are two, two quite different perspectives here. And if we move to the next slide, when we look at what keeps ships, keeps, uh, ships safe, again, we have these two perspectives. The investigator is a bit more formalistic and a, a bit more systemic, and the seafarers is a bit more personal. Um, but it was very interesting to see these, these factors come out. And it was interesting to see procedures, because we've heard a lot of negative things about procedures, but the seafarers recognise that at the end of the day, the procedures are there to keep them safe. So that was quite interesting for us. So having, having done all this analysis and presented at uh, a few forums, we, we said, okay, where, where should we go? Where should we suggest that uh, the shipping heads next? And there is safety culture, there's reporting culture, just culture, culture of care, which is quite new, which has um, uh, arisen in, in maritime and actually in aviation, we're quite interested in that. But what we decided um, was that learning culture um, was the way to go because there, there seemed just an appetite and we, we really saw some excellent learning practices in the industry. But learning culture is not like a brand, it's not something you just say, yes, we're a learning culture, you actually have to do things. So we, we looked at what Maritime was doing and what we do in aviation and came up with some waypoints which, which can be, uh, can help navigate towards a, a true safety learning culture. And so, yeah. So we have this, um, in safe mode, we have what we call a safety learning cycle. And 
it's quite obvious if you think about it, you, you capture data, whether that's from instance, accidents, near misses, or even observation, um, or just talking to, to the crews, etc. Then you analyze it and then you extract safety lessons. So those first three are, are the basic ones everyone does. Um, what you can do though, is try and do deeper learning, um, system-wide learning, um, just deeper learning. I'll talk about what that means in, in a moment. And that's something we, we try to do and we, we think um, shipping could get into. And so we, we elected um, 10 different approaches which we think the shipping industry could, um, could adopt and, and adapt um, and, and grow in, inside the industry to really deliver a true uh, learning culture. And yeah, if you can just click a few times, Maria. So, so there's data capture, analysis, um, safety learning, deep learning, and then translating that into operation and maintenance. And it, it is really important that it translates, you know, le learning that occurs on shore or in, or in papers or in uh, journals or conferences or forms, it, it must get through to the people on the ship. Um, it must become part of their, their ways of working. Yeah. So the first thing <clears throat> Safe Mode is recommending is, is a taxonomy. So we, we looked at things like the, the deadly dozen um, and other taxonomies. And, and these are useful and they, they're helpful. They have the, what we call the usual suspects are there in terms of what people do and the conditions um, that, that affect them. But we wanted to be a little bit more um, precise and go a little bit deeper because we were hearing that these organizational factors are, are missing. And so this is a, a, what we call the shield taxonomy. Um, it has actually about a hundred or so terms in it in, in full. But you can see it goes deep, not just the top line, what people did and the immediate factors, um, fatigue, weather, et cetera. <clears throat> Supervision there is, is also known as uh, work as done, but down, down below you get to the organizational factors, which, are, which can sometimes drive what's happening upstairs. Now, if you don't have a taxonomy, then you will have what's called a tower of Babel effect when people are looking at different incidents and accidents. They're all talking slightly different language. It's very hard to learn if you're not speaking the same language. So something we do in, in aviation, and in fact, the NTSB does it for transport in, in the US, but they have their, their 10 most wanted or the 12 most wanted. Um, in air traffic, we have the top five risks in, in Europe, for example, because there's a lot of battles to fight if you're, if you're working in safety. There's a lot of things, there's some things mentioned there, a few of them have already been mentioned in previous uh, speeches, and you can't fight all these on all fronts at all at the same time. So sometimes it can be useful for the industry um, to form a safety alliance or a company to just form its top 10 or top five and say, right, in the next year, we're really going to focus on these and drive change. So that's something we, uh, we recommend. Um, something we call safety deep dives. So um, for example, in enclosed fatalities and enclosed spaces. So if you can just go back. Yeah. Um, something like uh, fatalities and enclosed spaces, which seems to be a, a problem which is, which is hard to get rid of. It's already been mentioned, um, and it's not clear why it's hard to get rid of, but it's, it's, uh, it's a worry and it, it is, um, you know, it's killing people. So that's something where we would say, okay, you need to do a deep dive. You need to really dive into this and find out what's going on and maybe get some of the organizational or system, system wide factors, which, which are fueling it. Um, yeah. uh, we do a lot of human factors in aviation more, more than in uh, maritime. Um, so we've been working with the maritime partners in safe mode. So they've been trying out um, various human factors tools to see which ones can it can easily fit uh, the maritime and shipping shipping environments. And that work is ongoing and it will be presented uh, at the end of safe mode in, in November. <clears throat> the, the last one is, is new for both domains. Um, I, I did, had the honor of working with Professor James Reason about 30 years ago, um, one of the really gurus of um, safety culture. And he popularized Swiss cheese theory, which is that you have barriers to an accident and these barriers have holes in them. Um, and if the holes line up, then you get an accident. But most people focus on the barriers close to an accident. And what we don't tend to focus on is the ones upstairs, um, the ones which are far from the, uh, from the ship or the plane, the organizational factors, um, decisions which can be made at boardroom or just uh, standard practices in the industry which can constrain people um, working on, on the ship. And so we call this reverse Swiss cheese 
um, theory and we're, we're trying to develop this as an approach um, and it, there's quite a lot of interest in this, in this both, both in, the, in both domains actually that is something we're, we're working on so what is the way forward so here, here is a potential um, natural evolution if you like of using these approaches um, which can get you to the point of becoming a, a safety learning industry um, so you see there some some easy things to do are, are sharing of safety intelligence and creating safety alliances and forums uh, investigating differently etc and then moving all the way to deep dives and reverse swiss cheese so this is just a, na a natural evolution but you don't have it i mean you can start with you could do a deep dive tomorrow i mean these uh they, you don't have to follow this exact um exact plan but for example most organizations should be able to get to level two and quite, quite a few could be able to get to level three and within a reasonable time frame and that that would already be a big step in terms of safety learning culture and then if you want to do more advanced you go to level four and level five and, and we have used this kind of stepwise approach in in aviation to, to really um, improve our safety code safety culture over the past 20 years so in conclusion yeah. So we, we have um, at the back of the, the white paper um, a number of uh, really interesting case studies on safety learning, um, where these different organizations have shown what safety learning means to them. Um, so that's useful to show this isn't just theory, but you know, it's, it's already practice. So safety learning culture is seen um, by us, by this study, as the most promising destination for shipping. And as I say, the case studies um, and the material in the white paper itself really shows that shipping is, is already on the way and, and so do the, the keynotes we've already had this morning. So if, if you adopt these safety learning practices and, and perhaps others, um, then that will help transform the industry um, into a, a safety learning culture. What that means is that safety learning becomes a reflex. It's not something you have to ask people to do, they will just do it. So I'd just like to thank um, all the uh, participant organizations that really helped us get to where we are today. Um, this has really been a, a collaborative effort. So thanks very much to all, all of those and, and others, as I say, the forums we, we've had on this. And with that, I'd just like to say um, thanks for listening and I look forward to, to questions um, later on. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Barry Kirban for uh, introducing the work conducted um, to the maritime community, to the general public. Now we will uh, move on to the uh, panel uh, discussion. Uh, for attendees, um, um, you can um, uh, post your questions, comments on the question and answer um, chat, question and answer box. So we will address uh, some of uh, this later uh, in the panel discussion. Um, and the panel discussion, along with um, Dr. Barry Kirwan, uh, Professor Jens Eu, and we will uh, we have um, a few more distinguished um, panelists from industry, from civil uh, society, from um, and the maritime authorities. Uh, we have um, Captain uh, Asok, a manager from uh, Binko. Uh, we have Commodore uh, Jim Scorer, Secretary General uh, from the International Federation of uh, Seamasters uh, Association. We um, also have the pleasure to have Dr. Uh, Michel uh, uh, Manager of Vessels Operation uh, from the Australian Maritime Safety Administration. Uh, we also have um, uh, Mr. Osu uh, Hildeberg, uh, Head of the Danish Maritime Accident Investigation Board. And uh, last but not least, we have uh, Mrs. Uh, Victoria Norris, Vice Chair of the Human Factors uh, Committee uh, from uh, the Oil Companies International Maritime uh, Forum. So now, uh, Professor Rafael Boller will um, moderate this session. So, uh, please, Rafael, I will um, hand it over to you. So, thank you very much, Maria. Uh, thank you very much, Barry. Uh, I think what was very interesting is to have uh, an external view of, of what's happening in, in our industry. Uh, and it was good having Barry with very long experience in human factors in aviation, but also in nuclear industry, oil and gas, presenting what, what he was thinking of. What, what he also highlighted, and I think it's, it's very important for everyone to understand, it, it's just a way forward. It's not a perfect plan. It's not something which is frauded. It's just the beginning 
of a long journey. I, I think we have to see this way. It's a long journey probably ahead. Uh, we just have an exploration. Uh, it, need, it needs still a, a lot of research, a lot of work within the maritime community now to absorb the ideas, to work with it, and to see what we can come forward with. So that, that's a beginning of a long journey. And I think that's a very important to remember. Uh, but now let, let's see the, the perspective of this uh, global issue of learning basically in shipping with some very important uh, employment members of the maritime community. And here I would like first to, uh, to ask uh, Osur uh, from the Danish Maritime Accident Investigation Board to explain us a little bit about the importance of investigation to enhance learning, to enhance maritime safety. And eventually, if you can, uh, provide some small example for us to really capture what, what's happening today uh, in, the, in the world. Thank you very much, Osur. Sorry, tech issues. Yeah, thank you, uh, Ralph. Um, so, do we? Do we? I could talk all day about how do we learn from accident casualty investigations, and there's it's multi-layered, it's multifaceted, and so on. Um, we have in a casualty investigation community many um, challenges in 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 how to produce quality reports and how do we promote learning from those reports. Uh, they're challenging demands. Uh, arguably, it is very difficult to learn from casualty uh, investigations um, um, if we uh, only focus uh, on one casualty uh, and one recommendation set from that casualty, because a casualty investigation is only one um, snapshot of one particular event at one particular time at one particular place on one particular kind of ship. So there are limits to what we can learn from that because it's very difficult to generalize from one event. Now, when we do investigations, we also accumulate a lot of information or data across different investigations. And we have not been really effective in producing horizontal analysis from all that information we get, uh, where, we, um, where we get knowledge about how the intentions of the regulations and the safety management systems and how technology is being introduced in ships. And we get a lot of knowledge about that, but that is not really transposed into any uh, horizontal analysis from where we can generalize across the domain, which has become a... Um, a problem when we want to promote change in the in the uh, domain and also uh, regulators shipping companies they uh, are rarely convinced by one particular accident and one particular snapshot of one accident unless obviously it's a big disaster um, and that is uh, so when we talk about learning it's not just about accumulating knowledge it's also about promoting some sort of change and promoting that change has be become increasingly difficult because safety is not a goal in of itself. It is also um, uh, uh, there are competing demands to creating safety and implementing that change. So we, casualty investigation bodies need to be convincing in their data. And uh, that is where I think the big challenge for investigative bodies lie in the future, which is to accumulate data across accidents and do more horizontal analysis so we can generalize from our own knowledge. Thank you, Thank you very much for that. I will just jump on that and go to the Professor Jens Uwe Schroeder, Henrich. Um, Öster was talking about the idea of horizontal analysis, of course, collecting data in terms of quantity, but also quality of data. Uh, but the analysis uh, needs probably a, an extended cooperation. All this data gathering, processing, and what to do after it means like uh, we need to have a very strong dialogue between researchers, operators, and decision makers. How do you see that uh, dialogue? How do you see that dialogue in shipping industry now? Thank you, Rafael, for the question. Um, I think that's 
that's a very important aspect in it, if not one of the key aspects, in fact, that we can establish such a dialogue. Um, I think what is important is that we um, understand and appreciate the different roles and positions that industry has, that administration has, but also research has. And I think uh, my the previous speaker has just highlighted a couple of questions and Barry earlier also reported about some of the challenges that we experience in relation to um, accident reporting in general, the quality of data, uh, the challenges related to horizontal analysis. I think if um, more substantial progress should be achieved, uh, we need to, um, to, to understand the value that accident investigations have in principle and also the value of incident reporting. So why do we do all of this? It is actually quite expensive for a shipping company to do this. And um, at the same time, what are the effects? What can we achieve with this? I think um, as far as, as, as research is concerned, maybe we haven't been very good in focusing on those aspects. What are the benefits that could result from this? We have focused very much on the question of explaining what an accident is. And I have experienced a couple of times being an academic myself that practitioners can be very often frustrated with the plural of, of accident causation models that we had. I have spent quite some time with, with um, professional accident investigators and different accident investigation bodies who simply told me, I mean, why is this model better than the other one? Can you actually recommend what is the best model that we should follow? And academics are probably not very good in saying, okay, we all agree that that's the model that, that fits. At the same time, of course, a regulator wouldn't like to include, for instance, a model not knowing if that model would not be seen as the best model in 10, 15 years from now, and then all the regulations need to be changed. That can be actually quite challenging. So, and then also, I mean, when you are looking at the different roles of, of academics and, and, and investigators, an investigator basically has to stick very much to the evidence. And therefore, of course, what an investigator puts into a report has to be fact-based whereas an academic can try to explain what an academic sees in an accident. And there might not always be 100% of uh, the evidence to fully explain that, but sufficient evidence at least to make that assumption. So I think what accident investigators can say and, and what researchers can say is, is fundamentally different and, and that's a challenge. So therefore I think that dialogue is necessary in order to improve the situation. And of course, I mean, as, as Uso just pointed it out, it is about seeing the big picture. We have um, very different approaches to accident investigations. I'm aware that many industry organizations collect uh, accident investigation data on specific aspects. Are we able to link all of that for a, a better picture? And also when we are looking at accident investigation boards, very often when you look at the websites, you just find lists of very excellent accident investigation reports, but where is the overall analysis in terms of trends? Not every accident investigation board does this. And I think only when we are able to, to promote accident investigations and the value that all of that creates, maybe then in the end, we are coming to a situation where instead of after experiencing a difficult situation on board a ship where the seafarer said, good luck, uh, we have just managed to go through of that, but let's not talk about it. We will then come to a situation where we say, let's talk about it, where that others can actually learn lessons and improve before an accident is going to happen on a different ship. Th thank you very much for this explanation of this need of cooperation, but also the complexity and the difficulty to cooperate in the real world. And, and also a lot of questioning from the academics on both sides. I mean, what is really the aim of it? And, and if we come back to the idea of the aim is very much to learn something out of it. Um, how in this respect, this, uh, this changing culture in aviation has been happening? I mean. Was it easy for all the industry to accept uh, new learning practices to enhance collaboration between the management and the and the operators? How, how did it work? And what were the barriers to uh, to to learning culture in the aviation now? And let, let's focus only on the aviation aspect. Okay, thanks. So, um, Raphael and I had a 
had a drink last night and I told him a few things and he said, you should say that tomorrow. And I said, really? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so um, safety, safety culture um, got off to a rocky start actually in aviation and um, there was quite a bit of resistance. I mean, it, it was something new, it was seen as soft and fuzzy, uh, didn't seem to fit in the SMS. And, and so there was attempts to kill off safety culture in the, in the first few years. Um, Luckily, it, it already showed that it could really help. Um, some, some chief executives found it very useful um, because they, they finally knew all the risks um, that they, they were meant to be uh, managing and responsible for. But it, it got off to quite a rocky start. Um, I would say the first five years were, were, were touch and go. <clears throat> after, after that, it, um, it settled down, became part, part of the furniture. Um, just culture is, is, is tricky. I was talking recently at an airport and I said, you know, just culture isn't, um, doesn't come easily to anyone. It's, it's not actually that intuitive. You see somebody make a mistake and you think, why did he do that? I would never do that. And, and, that, and that's a natural reaction. And it takes, um, it takes time to take on a systems perspective and, and really understand that. And that's something you, so just culture is law in, uh, it's enshrined in European law for aviation. And so technically all aviation companies have to have a just culture policy, they have blah, blah, blah. Um, but it doesn't mean that everyone on the ground really believes in it. And, and that's an ongoing process. We, we are continually talking to people about um, just culture, what it means. Um, we talk to prosecutors because uh, any national prosecutor can decide to prosecute um, a controller or a pilot if, if they, they can do that. It, it's very rare, but, but it's... Uh, it's something that can happen. So it, it is an ongoing process, but I think we are winning that battle. But again, it took uh, quite a long time um, to do that. And something else I'd like to pick up on, which, which you've just both been talking about and, and someone else. We, we used to talk about safety data and people said, you know, data is the new oil. Um, but it, and, and it's like money, you can collect money, but it's, it's no good unless you spend it. So, um, so we now talk about safety intelligence. Um, it's what I think Jens was just saying that you need to take this data and say, okay, what are we, what are we going to do with this data? What can we extract from this? How can we turn this in, into knowledge, into practices, um, into real learning? And so that's why on one of the slides, I don't say sharing safety data, I say sharing safety intelligence. Because data, um, we used to have a repository and I used to call it a cemetery because stuff would go in and nothing would ever come out. So um, that, that also has been a... That took some years to, to really move to really safety intelligence sharing. Um, where we are now, um, I mentioned safety forums and safety alliances in top, top fives. We, we have something called a safety team, which is all the, um, the, the managers, safety directors around Europe um, meet together and they discuss the top five. They talk about the SMS. Um, this safety alliance is very strong. And actually, and out of that, we, we can have the top five. We have safety, safety clips. And one of the case studies in, in the white paper is from the uh, UK P&I Club, and they're, they're doing something very similar. Um, and the, these clips, these videos can be shown to, um, to pilots, to controllers. They're just two or three. I mean, if you want to know something these days, you look at YouTube, that's what you do. So we're, we're trying to use this media um to really bring it home to people as i mentioned earlier you, safety learning has to go to the people at, at the sharp end um so that's something we're we're very, very involved in at the moment um we also did work on the taxonomy um to avoid this tower of babel effect quite early on um back in uh, the 2000s and once we got that that straight that really helped um learning because we have all these different cultures to, and, but we're talking about the same thing I mean, what it means that that was really um, quite structurally useful in, in safety, safety terms. Um, <clears throat> but interestingly enough, we, we have this safety management standard of excellence and we are aware we we rate organizations or they rate themselves as to where they are on a five point scale in different safety management uh, elements. And we're now looking at that again. And, and this, this work we've been doing at Maritime has caused us to reflect on some of these, saying, well, are, are we really doing the best? We've actually modified things. So this is where, as I say, safe mode is a, is a two-way street. I think uh, aviation is learning from, from Maritime. 
but um, yeah, so that's, uh, it's, it's not always um, a rosy garden in aviation, <laughs> I'd like to think it was, but, uh, but you know, we're getting there. Yeah. So, so, thank you very much. I, I think what, what, what we really take from, from this, it, it's, it's still very complicated. It's not, it's not uh, done completely in aviation. It's still in the process. I mean, safety culture is not something given, even if it's becoming in the regulation, just culture, it's not something given. It's a long process. It started, you said, 20 years ago for you in this journey, and you still are doing quite a lot on everyday basis. You were mentioning that you are also having new project going on. On this, yeah. it, it's still it's still going on, so it's a long process. But the idea, very much, that I, I, I took it. So learning is coming from people to the shop, and and and, yeah. and this is the idea of how we can enhance this dialogue, this trust, mm. these elements of cooperation. Uh, you were also highlighting the importance of being able to assess self-assessing i would say yes. the safety culture so developing the tool for that and it's it's something that we, we also intend to to develop with uh, with safe mode and we'll probably yes. discuss this at, at a later yeah. stage yeah so, i can just just one minute on yeah. that because we are developing an app um to to do safety culture we, we've been doing safety culture surveys for 20 years now um it's a little bit of a heavy process and even some some companies in aviation have said can we have something lighter so we're now developing an app okay. um which is just 15 questions takes five minutes and and this uh will be developing for both aviation and, and maritime okay thank you very much for this uh, this information definitely when the app will be uh, released uh, when it will be functional we will have a beta version in in june i have to present i have to present this white paper to the aviation community okay. in june okay and also that at the same time we'll be presenting this app uh, okay thank you very version. much thank you very much so when when the app will be released definitely we will try to to also spread the information around the maritime community and see how we can use it best in our in our industry. Thank you very much for that. Uh, now, now we'll just go to very much a, a maritime person to uh, to Dr. Uh, Michel Gresh from the Australian Maritime Safety Agency. Uh, I just have uh, two small questions because on the recent past, uh, Australia has been uh, working on safety culture in the maritime field, and it was very interesting to see this trend and the report published by by, by the AMSA. Uh, so what, what, what are the barriers you have been noticing uh, in the shipping industry against basically the, uh, and the difficulty for shipping to absorb learning culture? And also what, what is EMSA now doing to overcome these challenges uh, in order to enhance safety culture in shipping? Yeah, thanks, Raphael. I hope you can hear me well. Um, thanks for the paper. It's an excellent paper. I, I, I have read that. And it's good to see that the aviation is not all rosy. <laughs> um, so, so from our perspective, I suppose what's been identified in this particular paper is something that we've actually um, also identified in our previous uh, research that we've done, but also in our un understanding of the shipping. So the perception in industry that this affair is the cause of error. So that's problematic within the industry. And we identified in our previous studies that um, we did actually carry a, an analysis of this and what we identified. We actually also use a taxonomy to actually categorize the data, which is the HVAX model um, as well, um, which is developed for aviation, but it kind of worked well for this particular study. And what we identified was that to some extent, um, officers identified when we asked them the questions of sources of hazard and they pointed to the crew as sources of hazard which was quite interesting but then when we asked them about where are the sources of pressure and the um, that uh, and most of the issues of scheduling that come from they identified that they were mainly organizational issues so there was there's already this concept within the industry that this affair is is the problem and this is something that we will need to work on and, and change because obviously, as your paper suggests, it is difficult to have a safety culture and an effective safety learning culture when it is believed that only the CIFAR make mistakes um, of any consequence. So, so that's one of the issues we think that we really need to work on in the industry because that also hinders or impacts our reporting culture. So we see that as, as a problematic. The other one is, which is very much related to this, is the limited understanding of um, human factors. Obviously, the dirty dozen. So, so we see that is um, a barrier to um, uh, to the concept of learning culture. Lack of safety leadership came out strongly in our previous uh, research, 
but also the aspect of fatigue and crewing um, and pressure on, on, on the crew, what we refer to as, as manning, and we prefer to use the word crewing from our perspective. Um, it, that comes out very strongly in the research, but also when we do inspection. So um, we should in the region of 400 portrait control deficiencies relating to fitness for duty and work and rest hours in the last three years. So you can see that's kind of problematic from an industry perspective. Now, in terms of how AMSA um, navigates through these challenges, I suppose one of the aspects that we focus on is the incident reporting. So we, we believe that if incident reporting systems don't analyze the relationship between contributor factors or, or across systems, then they are not fit for purpose. So what we try to do is we to try to promote incident reporting as much as we can. So we've designed our incident reporting to be able to actually promote learning, but also provide the opportunity for operators to tell us what were the systems that uh, were at risk and how they actually put their control measures in place. And what we've seen is that we've seen a substantial increase in reporting um, uh, of international ships coming into Australian waters, which is really good. But then it doesn't stop there because what do we do with those reports? And that's where the, the learning cycle comes into play. So we do actually code all our incident reports. We have an occurrence type framework, but we also investigate so, some of those particular incidents and we code those investigations. We also use ATSB's investigation reports as well. And we code them using a taxonomy, which we developed based on James Reason's and, and model. So that means we can extract the more richer data and information. As a regulator, we've got another set of data, which I tend to refer to as normal operation data. We've got the inspection data. It's a massive data, which we use in combination with our incident reporting data and the coded investigation data. And that what that gives us is the learning aspect. So we actually use that data to then identify um, uh, some of the safety issues or some of the risks that we need to focus on. So it actually forms the basis of what we refer to as our national compliance plan. So every year AMSA releases the national compliance plan, which is actually data informed and um, data driven. So the intent is that the focus will be on those areas, the top areas that we believe are of high risk um, from a safety perspective. And our commitment is for a consistent intelligence-led and risk-based approach to compliance and safety. So that's how we approach it. So we actually release a national compliance plan um, every year now. We're actually developing our next compliance plan now as we speak, and we're refining that process in terms of making sure that we actually include, include our data. And then the other thing that we do is we also release information which includes human factors principles within that guidance and information. As you know, we're involved in putting together the IMO um, uh, fatigue guidance. So we've actually redeveloped that into a more usable format, but we also um, have released the uh, safety awareness bulletins, which includes human factors principles and data. The recent one is actually on hours of work and rest and fatigue. And we've also focused on the concept of care because we believe that's really important. The aspect of mental health and seafarer well-being is core to safety. So we ran a mental health campaign and a, a number of research um, projects during COVID because we really needed to understand that and be able to know what we needed to implement as a result. Yeah, but, but obviously we need to continue working with industry and that's really important. Um, I, I know there are people from industry and in, in this panelists group, so I'll be very interested to hear um, where, where, where this is heading from an industry perspective. <clears throat> Thank you very much for your, for your words, Michelle. I, I just want to, to, to summarize a little bit and to highlight that the important that CFRs are not a problem, they are probably a solution that we need to expand the dialogue with them and to work and to really understand what is the situation uh, of the operators. Uh, you have been highlighting several times the problem of crewing issues and spe specifically highlighting the, the fatigue and all the work that you've done in the past, but you are still continuing working on this from a now a more compliance uh, perspective. Uh, you were also very much highlighting uh, the need to better understand human factors. And I think it was all around your work and what your, your, uh, your answer was the importance of learning and understanding human factors. And, and, and I like the idea by the end, you, you finish with the idea of mental health. 
And it's all about that, this, this learning, this need to learn more about human factors, which has been also revealed by, uh, by Barry during, during this work. Thank you very much. And it was very interesting also to see the different barriers and, and the fantastic work that you are doing in Australia and all the research which is behind. Thank you for that. Um, now I would like to go to a more uh, operational person uh, uh, to, the, to the IFMA, to Captain uh, Jim uh, Scorer. Uh, and, and I have a small, small question, which is, which is coming again and again on the chat, and probably you've seen, you've seen it. Um, it's how to strengthen uh, sheep and shore relationships, because it looks like there is a gap in understanding between uh, sheep and shore and what to do, how to do, and how to build this trust, how to enhance cooperation in order to work together better and to learn together to improve safety. What, what, what do you think about that? Uh, I could go on forever, I think. It's, it's, it's the age-old question, really, isn't it? Um, the shipmaster, of course, uh, on his or her ship, uh, is king, uh, and or is supposed to be. And if you look at the, the role of the shipmaster, um, he has that ultimate res res responsibility. However, what he is doing a lot of the time is implementing... Uh, the policies and the procedures that are being developed ashore and that that is a really important relationship which has to uh, develop uh, between the shore and the ship and the problem is is that over the years we are going um, further and further away from having um, stability in crews uh, shipmasters uh, and in those people who are running it ashore. Um, we are losing those long-term shipping companies who had a strong relationship with the sea, uh, where as a shipmaster and you would develop through the fleet and then come ashore and you had all of that knowledge and how you implement that. Um, and a lot of that is being lost in my view uh, and there is a lot of trust is being lost because of that lack of perceived expertise ashore. And in many cases, if you look at the, the current seafarer, um, they're no longer on long-term contracts. Um, they're being offloaded to a management company. They may have um, being employed trip by trip. So there is no loyalty between the ship's crew and, and the company who they may be working for at that time. Who is the company? Is it a charter company? Is it an owner? Uh, is it a, a, just a pure management company? How good are they? I mean, there are an awful lot of very good ones, but there's some pretty shoddy ones out there. And of course, so that all sets up a bit of the fear factor because they don't want to say anything because they know that if they stick their head above the parapet well away you go sunshine that's your last job with us we'll get somebody else who'll do the job and this is the way we want to go and 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 it is all a bit of a worry and 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 something that you know um michelle sort of mentioned and has been just in in the offing is this fatigue issue People just sort of throw it out as that fatigue is a bit of an issue. No, fatigue is a huge issue. Um, which industries in the world allow their um, crew to work over 95 hours a week? You know, I mean, this is obscene. Um, it, it is allowed, and it's up to 95 hours, but we all know that it's significantly longer than 95 hours. And so here we are talking about a safety culture. We're talking about um, something that involves all of our people at sea and the shoreside people have a responsibility to work with the experts on board to see how they can implement these things. And so certainly in my experience in, in running a, a company of, okay, it only had five um, ships, we went on board. Uh, we worked with the crews because our view is is that a safety culture doesn't start from the start at the top and work down. It actually has to be developed from the bottom and work up, because that's how you get that and develop the understanding uh, with everybody, and that develops the trust uh, between the shore 
uh, and the crew. You know, and, and in amongst all of this, you've got the, your shoreside workers who are working up to 40 hours a week in general compared to their counterparts. And they, so they, they seem to forget very quickly the pressures that the seafarers are under. Um, and I know we, we in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the white paper, we have this why uh, element, but actually um, it is very true. Why do these um, highly trained people still make mistakes? They forget the basics. Now, why is that? You know, we're, I'm not blaming the individual person, but there is a, there is a whole uh, plethora of things that develop that, whether it is from pressure ashore, pressure to sail, pressure to do this. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. You know, only uh, last month, we had a, a very highly qualified um, chief officer who did the most ridiculous thing. And you think, how would he do, why would he do that? And he lost his life. It was a dangerous situation. You know, he effectively killed himself. And why was that allowed to go on on board? And, and of course, as I said at the IMO at the time, who knows the pressure that they were under? You know, some of those people, some of our seafarers have been at sea for over two years without getting a break because of COVID, you know, and so we all talk about how important our seafarers are, but our seafarers don't feel important. They're not treated as important. They're just treated as inanimate objects that have to do this to get the ship from A to B. And if they die, will they die? That, and that is, I mean, I'm being very cynical, but that is how seafarers are now looking at the industry um, and particularly our politicians, because I know our industry try very, very hard uh, to make it better. But our politicians and our people, I'm afraid, they don't, do they really, really care? And I think from a seafarer's perspective, that's, uh, it's, it's a real concern. And we see it every single day. And as a classic example, look what p have just done in the UK. You get rid of all of your highly qualified. Oh, okay, yes, you pay them well, but they're highly qualified. They cost too much, get rid of them. Let's get the lowest common denominator in, the cheapest you can find, the least train, throw them on board, and it'll be fine, won't it? Sorry. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Commodore, uh, for this uh, quite bleak picture, in fact, of the situation. Uh, uh, I've seen that there is a, a request from uh, Captain Kunal. Just he, he wanted to to say something. If I no, no, was, sorry, that was a mistake. My apologies. Okay, no problem. Thank you very much. I just want to to, to wrap up a little bit what you were were saying, Jim. Uh, the, the role of the shipmaster. I, I think you started with this idea that there is a uh, people on board and people ashore. It looks like the people ashore decide the policies and procedures and the shipmaster have to implement them. And it looks like there is a mismatch between them. So it's very much also what, what was the, all the idea of organizational factors. And you were highlighting also another important element is pressure, which is also organizational factors and the need also probably in the shipping industry to work more on this idea of organizational factors. The contractual agreement is basically also the problem of organizational factors. If we, if we use it in a more academic sense, huh? But it's, it's definitely very important. You were, you were also highlighting, as, as uh, Michel before, the, the importance of fatigue and, uh, and here that it's becoming something very strange that uh, some people working on the same company on shore 40 hours and the other one 80 to 90 or plus hours a week. It's like, what, what's happening here and how, how the people don't realize that? Um, and there were one very important element, I, I think, when, when you were bringing your experience and highlighting Yes, safety culture, yes. When I was in my company, we were going there. We were going to the ship. We were talking to people. We were just interacting to learn directly from what's happening. I think it's a, it's a very important element that you highlighted, this, this how to learn directly, how to, in, to create a, a trust dialogue with people. And I would like for that to, to have a, an industry person to come uh, and explain a little bit what's happening. I mean, Professor uh, Jens Uwe Schroeder was highlighting that BIMCO for already a long time is interested in uh, in dealing with uh, safety culture. So I would like to know a little bit more from the safety
the future perspective and what, what is now doing the industry uh, players like, like BIMCO, uh, what, what do they think about this trend and, and what would be the next step basically to enhance safety culture and learning culture in the, in the shipping industry and what would be the benefits also of it? Um, yeah, th thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, perfect. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, first of all, let me start by congratulating the entire team for the work that you've done and, and the result that, that you've brought. I think it's it's great work. Uh, so, so so big congratulations and, and thank you to, to all the speakers that spoke before me because they've spoken some very important points which I wanted to speak. So my, my work has actually shortened a bit. And, and, and I also would say, like to thank all the all our participants from wherever they are. They, they are asking some excellent questions and some, some very good comments. So um, to, to give you a very quick introduction of what BIMCO is, BIMCO is, is, is a shipping industry association and, and we have members, ship, ship owners mainly, approximately 800 plus ship owners who, who are members, ship owners and ship managers. But other than that, we also have a number of other uh, other members totaling up to 2,000. But 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 the work that we do mainly is is focused on our ship owners and and um, and also seafarers because seafarers are part of, of the shipping company. Um, like like it was already mentioned that that the, the shipping company they're not they're not shall I say uh, it's it's not that nothing is happening uh, there's there's a lot of lot of things that's already happening within a, a company level and and when we speak to some of our members and some of the systems that they have it's uh, it's it's quite sophisticated in in how they uh, how they uh, um, learn get this information regarding safety and and how they uh, uh, pass it on to within their fleet. But there's also initiatives that where the, the, where the shipping companies are, are uh, discussing among the other companies. And in fact, direct competitors, they are, they are, um, they are passing on information about uh, safety incidents to direct competitors because it actually uh, increases their entire uh, uh, safety level. So that's, so that's a lot of, uh, a lot of those happening. Um, I would just like to point out a, a few things. One, one word was reporting culture that was mentioned quite a few times. And, uh, and, um, and, uh, and many a times when we see reporting, when we see near -miss reporting, and we see, yeah, near -miss reporting mainly, not really accident reporting, it is somehow linked to a KPI. Uh, it's, it's, they've been given numbers and, and they've been, they've been uh, uh, so, so that's how it's linked. And, and sometimes we also see uh, companies uh, discouraging uh, ships to to not report the, the the big accidents because that that are that also um, uh, is, 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 is it, it takes a bit on their reputation so so those things are also happening but but overall the the, the reporting culture is actually improving from where it was 30 years ago and it is going in in a, in a quite good uh, way uh, there's also um, some industry initiatives that we're doing, and I heard the word enclosed space mentioned quite a few times and, uh, and enclosed space uh, accidents. Um, industry organizations, we have, we have uh, uh, sort of uh, formed a group called the Human Element Industry Group, and, and we are working on, on something uh, to, to improve this, uh, the, the issues with enclosed space. And, uh, and, uh, and one of the things that I think some, some mentioned, it's, it's about the pressure, but um, but there's there's one one specific thing that that uh, that was that wasn't mentioned explicitly, and that is time pressure. Now, if you if you give uh, a seafarer to a, a number of um, uh, uh, jobs to do, and then and then you give a little time, they are of course going to try and complete it within the time, and that's going to be that's going to be an issue, uh, and and that's where they start to look at look at shortcuts, and and that's closely linked to fatigue, and I, and I would like to thank Australia for for having come up with uh, with, with their new unupdated fatigue guidelines, and I and I do hope um, the the other governments also uh, come out with uh, with such such guidelines, and um, uh, this yeah finally. Um, Accident investigations. Now, whenever you read an accident investigation report, you read uh, you read the word saying that this investigation report uh, does is is not meant to apportion blame. Uh, it's only to it's only there for for learning. But in the end, that's that's exactly what happens uh, because somebody has got to got to decide uh, who has to pay for it. Uh, the insurance has to know. So it somehow uh, gets there. So there are things that, that we need to, that we need to um, uh, still improve. And, uh, and I think, uh, again, uh, a lot of great work has already been done. And, uh, and, um, uh, and yeah, again, congratulations to, to, to your team for the, for the work. 
Thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate your, your intervention. I think it was very important to highlight also this. There is reporting, and this reporting is improving in terms of quantity, in terms of quality. But you were also highlighting that uh, even if it's improving, there is still some key elements that are, are not really encouraging, like uh, it's perceived as a KPI and nothing more, I would say, than that, if I just extend your sentence. Uh, and also, there, it looks like some at least seafarers or are just discouraged to report because they are just a little bit afraid of what would be the consequence of it. Um, <clears throat> but also, on the other hand, you were very much highlighting this improve another very important improvement, which is very much in line with what Barry was saying in his conclusion was the importance of working together, of sharing information between companies that uh, trying to have the things happening together, uh, establishing this human element industry group, which is a very, very good news. And it's a, and we really hope that it's gonna work a lot more and gonna come with very, very uh, tangible outcome. It's very important. The, the importance also of investigation, which was highlighted by Barry again, and, and this link, uh, what, what are we doing to do with the investigation? What will be the outcome? Only learning or use it for other purposes, which can affect its uh, the willingness to report. Thank you for that. And, and what was very reassuring, it's a, a big organization like BIMCO just pushing ahead that. And I think it's a, it's a very, very good sign that the industry is moving forward uh, for better safety and, and, and finding the same kind of a direction like uh, everyone is promoting. So I think it's a very, very positive uh, trend. Thank you very much for this, uh, this comment. I, I would like to know um, now if, uh, if we can have the view from, uh, from the OKIMF. Uh, probably before, uh, for, for the, the audience who is not aware of the OKIMF, I, I will invite uh, Ms. Norris to, to explain a little bit uh, what <coughs> OKIMF is, because it has a very specific role within the maritime industry, and especially with all the vetting and, and, and what you can use for this vetting. I mean, what, what the OKIMF can, can contribute with all the data that they are gathering for years and, and how they can expand the things, because you are, you are in quite specific place within the, in, uh, the industry. So please just, uh, Victoria, if you, can, if you can take the floor, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, I just wanted to reflect people's previous comments about the sort of quality of contributions to the conversation so far. So it's been really, really interesting to listen. So um, from Ockham's perspective, I think if I'm understanding correctly, the questions around how we are the role of our sort of OKIMF in promoting and contributing to an effective learning culture in the industry. Um, first of all, it's worth mentioning that, you know, OKIMF um, has set itself an objective to as a learning forum for and um, leveraging industry expertise. Um, and that's in service of OKIMF's core strategic objectives. Um, it also takes a very good risk-based approach to um, its, in its strategy, and this model is uh, one used for continual assessment, review and actions, which is laying the foundations really for OKIMP as a learning organisation. But I'm here today a little bit more to speak about the human factors approach that OKIMP have introduced um, over recently in the last couple of years. And, uh, listening to the comments before around um, human factors, human error. So OKIMP, the human factors approach that OKIMP have introduced is really centered at looking beyond the human error aspects that so typically many of our incident investigations might stop at human error and attribute human error to um, the causes of incidents. But the approach really is trying to now encourage and guide the industry to look beyond that and look beyond that to the systems and conditions in the workplace that maybe make work more difficult or are typically, um, and to a sort of us to understand better the conditions in which can, that can be created in which mistakes are more likely to happen so that we can learn from those and start moving forward to prevent and correct them. And I think this speaks to some of the frustrations that I've hit also hearing as to how is it possible that an ex extremely experienced seafarer can commit an error um, that perhaps costs his life. This is exactly where the human facts approach wants to encourage the industry to look to. So, but to support that, I mean, we recognize as well as many people have said before that we see people as the solution and not the problem. 
because the people give us the opportunity to learn. They can tell us what makes their work difficult. They can tell us if we ask the right questions and look in the right places as to what, um, what barriers are there to success. But what, um, what we've done in, in OCIMP is to set up the human factors approach, which essentially has five um, key areas and focus areas. One of them is about learning. So it's about learning before and after things go wrong, which uh, we might touch on a little bit later. But leading and shaping the culture you want is also another key of our key focus area. And that also focuses on how leadership shape culture. And I agree that it's not always just from the top down, but they definitely do set the tone for culture. Seeing people as the solution and not problem, but also the role of the organisation and industry wide conditions in creating that culture. So, but in more, more specifically, there are three other pillars also rely on a learner mindset. And we start to dig a bit deeper into the specifics. So we look at design. Someone mentioned design on the chat, how our well-designed equipment controls can help set people up for success, how well-executed tasks and procedures can set people up for success, and why, what would cause someone to not follow that procedure or execute that task well. So these focus areas also look at the skills to respond to emerging situations. So it's it's asking the industry to start learning from normal work and I think this is a key piece I haven't heard perhaps so much being talked about today learning from the front line on how work is actually done versus how we might imagine that it's done versus how we might proceduralize the work so our, our ability to respond to abnormal or emerging situations is also predicated by the existing culture on the ships so the framework that we've introduced is the hope is as we develop it, that it will provide practical steps and guidance for our member organisations to start looking at how they might really implement and consider human factors in their approach. And to touch on the specific question about the betting and inspection, you will notice that in the SIA 2.0, there is a human factors element to the betting and inspection, which is, in, is designed to start encouraging um, inspectors to look for human factors elements that might be contributing to um, human performance on board these ships and to encourage our member organisations to start taking those into account. So these are real practical steps that Ockham are taking. We're putting human factors and integrating into publications like our ISGOT, um, we have a human factors approach paper. We've also written a paper around, you know, to help our member organisations during the COVID crisis think about human factors such as fatigue and stress during the COVID crisis, so speaking to specifically to some of the points that people have raised. So that's that's what OCIP is doing in this space and uh, I'm open to any questions. Thank you very much, Victoria, for all this very interesting information. I mean, I, I will just take a few of them. The, the importance of uh, going beyond human error, that human factor is something else. We have to go beyond this. That focusing also more on the working conditions from the design and organizational aspect, what was said uh, before probably by Captain Ashok and, um, and the IFSMA about the idea of uh, pressure. Uh, how, how is it possible that these basic errors still happen and happen and happen again? That's always something which is very questionable. Uh, also, you were highlighting that people are the solution and can provide the solutions. Uh, I think it's very important to, again, this idea of dialogue between the decision makers and the operators, very important again. Uh, the importance of the industry responsibility to enhance learning culture, to enhance safety culture. The role of the OCIM, <clears throat> and especially what is interesting, you were highlighting the new SIRE 2.0, which is uh, making a big uh, step ahead in order to incorporate human factors in the assessment of the ships in the inspection of the vessels, and, and how much uh, OCIM has been working with uh, human factors, working group, with publication in order to promote a better understanding of what human factors is. Uh, thank yeah. you very much. Just, just before you go, one thing I did want to bring to the table was that the other belief that OCIMPs have is that there are not, there are, as we've heard a lot about incident investigation, incident reporting, our reaction and learning from incidents. But there is a whole area to explore that's a, that we haven't talked about today, which is learning before things go wrong. 
And for us, that would be a major focus area of Ockins. So learning after things go wrong is one thing. And we've talked a lot about the limitations of that and how things then reflect the reporting of incidents and our ability to get the data. But, but more, in a much more proactive way, how can we get out and look at these tasks and procedures before things go wrong? will be one of the major focus areas of Occupy going forward and it opens up a whole new space for us to explore, which potentially will allow us to get ahead in a proactive way, rather than just spending our time responding after the fact. So for us, when we talk about learning, that's the key piece, learning before as well as after things go wrong is one of our five focus areas. And and underpinning all of that, Occupy truly believe that the psychological safety um, culture is also one of the underpinning requirements for any changes in this. So those two pieces were the things of the way forward, the question that I wanted to bring to the table today. So psychological safety and learning before things go wrong. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to, to recall that and to expand a little bit. You, you said it, it was my mistake not, not picking up to the floor, but absolutely you said that it's important learning from normal words and what, what's happening when everything is okay. And which is a new trend and it's a very important trend to really happen in what makes safety basically and it's a, it's a very important uh, comment thank you very much um now i think it's uh we, we, we've been looking a little bit at the different questions from the floor and basically we addressed <coughs> all of them um as, as i mentioned there were some uh, some comments about uh, the, why we didn't integrate this uh, these filipinos for example are very important again it's what we said it's a new grant project first and the second element is it's an ongoing work. It's just a, a small snapshot. Uh, and the purpose is to start working all together to see what we can do together and continue the journey. It's a very long journey. Barry was highlighting it took 20 years to be there today. Uh, and it's not yet perfect. And it's still working a lot on this. So it's, it's a journey. And we have to think about it like this and not as something definitive, not as something imperative. This is the beginning of something, and this is what we are aiming at. We think it's important, and we just realized that a lot of other uh, maritime stakeholders consider it also as an important trend from the OKIM to the AMSA, from the AMSA to the investigators, from the investigator to the industry, to BIMCO, uh, et cetera, from also the, the practitioners with IFSMA, and, and also in, in other types of investigator. But I, I would like to, to close my, my remarks here and I'll give uh, the floor now for the close, concluding remarks to first to uh, Captain Jorgen and, first, and after to Captain Kunal. Uh, if uh, you can take the floor, please, Jorgen. Yes, yes, I'm happy to do that. I, I, I even though it may not, everyone would realize that I have had some enlightening moments in my life. And one of those actually was when I saw a video tape called, I think it was called Safety Culture, and it was some 15 years ago or so from Eurocontrol. And uh, uh, that, that was very interesting to see. And, and uh, I have, um, I remember it very good and and uh, and i'm happy to to continue this this uh, discussion uh, introduced to me by eurocontrol some some years ago then uh, we have been talking about the human element here and uh, normally when we speak about human element we we mean uh, or we we intend to talk about human failure but we, we, somebody has mentioned it already here, but I would just repeat it then. Then we can also talk about human success. And uh, when we are talking about accidents caused by human factor, which is, uh, it, it's very generic, I mean, to say that, but, but we, we never speak about thanks to the human factor, the accident did not happen. We we have been uh, we have been uh, hearing today that that the the accidents in maritime shipping industry is reducing, uh, and and uh, that is due to something, and that is not only technique and technology preventing accidents. It's also the human factor. 
uh, which also was mentioned by 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 Okim, that that the the resources is the uh, people on board. We also heard about the problem with horizontal analysis, and uh, that is exactly what we are struggling with within the correspondence group and working group in, in III. And uh, the, the challenge is there to, to find the big picture, to see it and to make some conclusions out of that. Uh, but another challenge is also to implement this in practice. I have uh, earlier in, in my uh, career, career been working with, with just that, trying to, to implement results from uh, analysis into the inspection unit within the inspectorate where I was working at that time. And uh, nobody, nobody did anything to, to prevent that to happen or, or uh, object to, objected to have this implemented in, in the inspection. But it seemed to me that was on, on an individual basis. But it seemed to me that the organization itself was not ready to, to, to make this transfer from the analyzing unit to the inspection unit. It never happened. Uh, and I, I can see that, that the, uh, we, we are in, in sort of the same situation in within IMO and this is not a complaint whatsoever it's not a complaint but I can just mention that it is not very easy to 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 have the conclusions from the correspondence group or the working group forwarded within IMO to the appropriate subcommittee and the appropriate working group to continue the work and 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 uh, turn it into practice. That is not easy. That is a bureaucratic problem we are struggling with at this very moment to to uh, to make this happen. So we have we have some work to do in these matters. But I'm very happy to 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 be part of it, and, and I have been enjoying myself listening to everything said today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for all your kind words, and also that you will be with us for the way forward. We appreciate it very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Captain Kunal Nagra, please, can you have the last remarks, please, uh, to conclude the, the workshop? Thank you. The floor is yours. Uh, thank, thank you, uh, Professor Rafael, and, and thank you to all the speakers. I think, I think as, as Captain Jorgen mentioned, there's a lot of work to be done, but I'm extremely pleased to hear the views of all of them, uh, all the panelists. And I've, I've summarized some key points that if you allow me to just take two or three minutes to, to look away from the screen because I, 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 I typed it down as I was listening. So I think we have to give ourselves, ourselves as a maritime industry a pat on the back. Uh, we really have come a long way. Uh, and it's, it's a little heartening to hear that the aviation has its set of own problems. And not just because there are some other issues, but at least maritime is not that not that bad. And it's important for us to recognize that traditionally the maritime stakeholders have always had accountability at its baseline. You know, finding the cause of the accident, find the scapegoat, sharpen the stick, and then move on. Move on and continue. The ships need to run 24-7. People need to sign on, sign off, and things keep going on. And that trend has probably set in a sense of fear in the mind of the, the seafarer that even if they want to come communicate some key issues, there is a hesitation or resistance in doing so that we saw from some of the chats. But as mentioned by Worcester and, and Dr. Barry earlier, that we need to have a concentration of information which we can intelligently analyze. And that's what alludes to what, what Jorgen was saying, that we have a lot of information, but it's difficult to make sense of that. And probably with, with, with the way things are going in artificial intelligence, hopefully at some point we can actually try and Machine, use machine learning to try and suss out some information and try and capture that intelligently for the one of a better phrase. Um, but I, I, do, I do really like a particular line by, by Commodore Jim earlier when he says experts on board. And that's the key point. The experts reside on board. 
I'm not suggesting that the experts do not decide ashore. They have been at sea, they've been ashore, but we have to recognize that in the current scenario, at all times, experts are still on board. And we cannot forget that that is the source of our inspiration for doing the work. Uh, and we have to take the uh, efforts to understand the reality of the ships rather than what's perceived by people as one making procedures and so on and so forth. So the key question is, do we want to learn? The obvious answer to that is yes. Well, then we ask ourselves, how do we learn? And this weaves into what I had said earlier, what we've heard from other speakers, we learn from everything. I mean, to make it transparent, separate from the outcome of accountability. And in conclusion, as a panelist from Ockham had also said, and aligned with the thoughts what I had earlier mentioned, that we need to learn all the time, before and after. So I, I, hope, I hope the audience takes those key words uh, as, as perhaps gospel truth, that yes, if we don't continuously learn, it goes back to my keynote as we cease to exist. So thank you for the time. Thank you very much. Um, we were here for learning. I think we've learned a lot today. Uh, and again, I think it's the beginning of a journey and we will try our best to have this uh, moving on. And we are, I thank you very much also for Barry from the, a different sector that came with his views, uh, different views and that we, we already talked together. We talked with the industry, with shipping companies, with seafarers. And it was particularly interesting to have also these views from the outside. Uh, a final word by Jim, please. Thank you. But just very shortly, please, because we are out of time. Thank you. I would just like to leave you with one thing. Seafarers don't want to kill themselves. Seafarers want to be safe. What seafarers need is time. And how can we give them more time to do their training on board? We have to reduce what we expect them to do. And it is not by making them work harder because they're already doing their 95 hours a week. It is actually finding time within that 95 hours for their training, their own personal training. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Special thanks also to Michel from, uh, from Australia, which is very late now, and we, we really appreciate your presentation. Thank you very much also from Captain Kunal. Uh, it was also difficult for you with the time. We really appreciate all this, and thank you for all the audience. Thank you for all the attendees and yeah, let's have the journey together. Goodbye. Thank you.